tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. Sean and Jody Bordeaux had been married two years. They had great jobs at a casino on the Kickapoo Indian Reservation in Kansas, and Jody was expecting their first child. Tragically, their dream life would be dealt a devastating blow. Who wanted to kill Jody Bordeaux? For hundreds of working class families, a school that offered affordable music lessons for their kids seemed too good to be true. It was. One owner loved the limelight. The other was a chameleon who mysteriously changed identities. Allegedly, both were ruthless con artists. Over the course of a decade, at least four young girls vanished under similar circumstances from towns in the San Francisco Bay Area. Many suspect the cases are somehow connected. One day, Gilbert Ortiz was a happily married family man and the next fighting for survival, after his wife allegedly poisoned him and ran away with her son. We'll bring you an update on Ortiz's heart-wrenching journey. Join me for these intriguing stories and more you may be able to help solve a mystery. November night in Powhatan, Kansas. A small farmhouse on the edge of the Kickapoo Indian Reservation. Jody Bordeaux and her husband Sean have lived here for over a year. For weeks they have been receiving Hello? disturbing anonymous phone calls. Hello. But on this night they weren't just calls. Jody was sure someone was in their yard. One night, she had heard noises outside of the house, and I tried to convince her that it was probably a raccoon or a coyote or something, and that she really didn't have nothing to be, aware, to be afraid of. But Sean was wrong. The danger Jody perceived was very real and would ultimately lead to her murder. Sean and Jody worked at the Golden Eagle. It was the first Indian-owned casino in the area. It held great potential for the Kickapoo tribe, with an annual revenue stream in the millions and job opportunities for the local tribespeople. Sean, who was part Lakota Indian, and Jody were part of the management team hired to run the casino. Although the Kickapoo Tribal Council retained the final word in all decisions. Sean and Jody were also trying to start a family after several miscarriages, Jody sought out a fertility expert, and within a few months, the couple's dream had come true. Jody was pregnant with a baby girl. She was absolutely ecstatic over this pregnancy, and th that her happiness was something that spilled over into her friends and her acquaintances, and everybody were just pretty much felt happy for her and with her. Everything seemed to be going Jody's way. Soon her take charge personality got her promoted to staff supervisor of the slot machine department. Jody was a little fireball. She put a lot of energy, a lot of effort into everything she did. So to see her in the casino, you would think she was running most things. And even that perception in and of itself is kind of a little bit, uh, it can draw jealousy and envy some, from some of the people who may be in the same position saying, how does she get all the attention? Jody believed that some of the staff were resentful of her new position. Good morning. Heard your grandmother died. For instance, one employee, a slot technician, accused her of fabricating excuses to get extra time off. Our busiest weekend? Good time to have to go off to a funeral. There's some competitiveness when it comes to these jobs. 
and having two people coming from other, you know, one from another tribe and one from no tribe at all and going into high positions in the casino, I'm sure rubbed a lot of people on the Kickapoo Reservation the wrong way. To complicate things, as a department supervisor, Jody's position required her to oversee job performance. According to Sean, Jody often had to report the slot tech's bad attitude and tardiness. He kept coming back with more uh, problems for her. And eventually, you know, she had to take a little bit more of a hard line on him and start uh, writing him up and holding him to the letter of the law as our policies and procedures mandated. We're here to talk about some reports we have about you being late for work. When I things didn't improve, the employee was brought before the casino management uh, board for review. I don't even know why some of those reports are even written. It's like everybody else gets away with everything. He was reprimanded and put on probation. Um, I'm the one who gets in trouble. But the problems persisted, and the slot tech was eventually fired. It was just weeks later when Sean believes out of vengeance, the slot tech brought a grievance against Jody directly to the tribal council. Look, uh, there's a meeting this afternoon. You need to attend. The complaint ultimately led to Jody losing her job. Due to the great cost so Jody spent the next month petitioning to get it back. Of each and every appointment I had she hoped the tribal council would reconsider. Can you think of anything else I can add? Jody was hoping that she would be rehired at the Golden Eagle. And that was a discussion that her and I had participated in. And there was a possibility that she would have come back to work at the Golden Eagle. When the news spread that Jody might return to the casino, the anonymous phone calls Hello. began. Hello. Never in my wildest dreams did I think they had anything to do with having to worry for our lives. I had no idea that we were being threatened. Late on November 21st, Sean and Jody were spending a quiet night at home. Did you find a car seat? Yeah, when a strange the noise startled the Bordeaux's dog, Sean followed him to the back porch. The next thing I hear is a popping noise kind of over and behind my head. And then it was like somebody lit a 20-pack of firecrackers. Jody got to the bedroom, and she turned to see if I was OK. And one bullet went into the bedroom. Jody? Jody? And that one bullet struck her in the head. Sean could see that Jody was dead. He quickly dialed 911, hoping to save his unborn baby. And as I pick up the phone and I look up at the wall, I notice that it's riddled with bullets. Jody didn't suffer in that she died instantly. But my baby suffered. You know, here's my little baby in there and she's relying on mom. And next thing you know, there's no mom. And she dies a slow death. That, that really hurts. So I think when I kissed her, I think it was her calling me in a spiritual way as to say, I have to go now. And that was goodbye. That night, Sean lost both Jody and the baby. And despite an exhaustive investigation, four years later, no one has been charged with the murder. The Bordeaux's home was so isolated, there were no witnesses. No weapon was found. Today, a killer is still on the loose. Kevin Hill is a county attorney assigned to the Bordeaux murder. He has been working with local and state authorities on the investigation. We've gone from a point where just about everyone was a possible suspect to a point where we're focusing on an individual or group of individuals that may have been responsible for this. These individuals were not strangers to Jody Bordeaux. 
Uh, individuals knew her and they would have had an axe to grind with her due to employment issues. But there are a few key roadblocks to capturing anyone involved. I believe that uh, part of the problem is just that uh, there's not a lot of trust with Indian people and non-Indian law enforcement. And that's probably part of the problem with, with the Inquisition and any other investigations that are taking place. There's been serious question about retribution of anybody coming forward. If there are members of the Kickapoo tribe that have any information that would help us solve this, they have a responsibility to their fellow tribal members, to their fellow community members to come forward. This is an unsolved crime here on our lands. Let's do something about it. I, I go through each day thinking of my family, thinking of what could be, thinking of my little girl. And so the most difficult thing is just watching my life go by without a family. Since the murder, Sean has left Kansas, but he still holds out hope that someday there will be justice for Jody. Despite Sean's belief that a casino employee was somehow involved in his wife's murder, authorities at this time have not released a list of official suspects. They seek your help in providing new information necessary for an arrest in this case. In a mostly working class Hispanic neighborhood in North Hollywood, California, something extraordinary was going on. One, two, three. Now, five, a new music school had opened and hundreds of parents eagerly signed up their children for low cost lessons. Very good, now let's go. The school was owned by Mario Yunus and Omar Arroyo, who hired veteran instructors to teach students a lost art of playing the accordion. I knew they had a hold of something big. And I knew it was going to be a lot of money. I just knew it. And I wanted it to work. Let's give John a round of applause. Mario Yunus and Omar Arroyo were an odd couple. Yunus was a studio musician fluent in several languages. Arroyo, an aspiring salsa singer and used car salesman. However, there was nothing unusual about their carefully crafted sales pitch. Their enthusiasm hit all the right notes. Wow, that was excellent. I'm very, very proud of you. And I, I think it's time for you to move up to the next level. Wow, that sounds great, Siri. Wonderful. They said that my daughter had won a scholarship to learn piano or accordion in Oregon. I thought, oh, great, you know, this is a perfect opportunity for my daughter to, to get some lessons. What I need for you to do is to choose one of those. I'm going to recommend that Vaudrey take the Mercedes package. Mario Yunus acted as a front man. Amazing. Charming and persuasive, he often met with parents, while his partner worked behind the scenes. Well, the Mercedes package is 2500 and the Toyota package is 1800 Oh, I see. I think I'll take the Toyota package. Well, so the I'm package saying? was that it was the accordion that you were buying, but they were going to teach three different instruments by the end of the three years. Taking $32 increments every month, if that's okay. And part of it would be also taking them on field trips like Disneyland. However, the ink was barely dry on the contract when everything fell apart. Early one morning, Martha Gallardo dropped off Vaudrey for her weekly lesson. It was a day mother and daughter would never forget. Mom, they're closed. What do you mean? Are you sure? Yeah. She said, nobody's there. They're gone. And at first I thought, oh, don't be silly, you know? But then it just like hit me. And I said, oh my God, fraud. That's the first thing that came into my mind because I knew I had given them my credit card. According to police, Martha's instincts were right. She had been targeted for fraud. Reportedly, Arroyo and Eunice even duped their own employees, lying about the credit card scheme and paying them with bogus checks. Got tired of getting bad checks. I don't know how many bad checks I got from how many different banks. And they said, well, we got another class for it. And I said, uh, uh, I gotta be paid. And they said, well, after you do this class, we'll pay you. 
John Caldwell taught the class, but he says he never saw the money. And when Martha Gallardo received her credit card bill, she found a single charge for the entire cost of the accordion, more than $1,800. Allegedly, it was a cheap import worth about $300. However, many other unsuspecting families, unaware of laws designed to protect consumers from credit card fraud, were reportedly hit much harder. The parents were mad, they were angry, they were hurt, because they, they, you know, they felt like, okay, wait a minute, we have no money. And what are we gonna do? These people, their credit cards were up to like 10,000, 20,000. One particular guy was 39,000. According to police, Omar Arroyo and Mario Yunus had swindled the money through identity theft by using personal information lifted from music school applications. Arroyo and Yunus were able to open fraudulent credit card accounts, some with substantial lines of credit. In just over a year, authorities say their take was an incredible one and a half million dollars. But these alleged con men also had another trick up their sleeves one that would surprise and shock everyone. We want some answers. You're all gonna have to leave. We, we the alleged scheme that. began to unravel when Martha Gallardo and some of the other parents found out the music school had reopened at a new location. We wanna speak to the owner. I don't know what you're talking about. A confrontation with the school's director, who police believe was also a pawn of Arroyo and Eunice, quickly became heated, especially when a TV reporter showed up. Moments later, officers arrived on the scene unaware that the school was allegedly a front for fraud. No, I'm the manager. These people are trespassing. Okay. All right. The irate parents were immediately escorted from the building and told to take their grievances to civil court. However, many families chose to file criminal complaints, including Martha and her husband. I know I appreciate that. Do you have a copy of the contract with you? Yes, we do. I've seen some real unique case, but I've never handled a case as this, uh, where you know it, it has so many uh, victims. Uh, we have over, I could say, 200 victims, and it involves a, a large amount of monies. Have you seen any two males that might have looked like the owners of the place? Detective Baio quickly discovered that the two alleged swindlers ran a number of music schools under a variety of yeah, aliases. Okay, and cash is okay, yes? Yeah, Meanwhile, according to police, Omar Arroyo and Mario Yunus went on separate spending sprees with some of the stolen cash. Arroyo reportedly spent more than $100,000 to cut a salsa CD under the name Luis Omar. Yunus had also crafted a new identity, but he was playing a very different tune. Oh well, I am his twin sister. She's from Israel. No kidding, yeah. Arroyo's real estate agent did a double take, and with good reason. Mario Yunus had undergone much more than a makeover. He was now a she, using the name Delia Leon. Place, wanna go take a look at it? I love it. Yeah, yeah, please, yeah. feel free. Take, wow. take a look, it's okay, great. great. Yeah. Mario Yunus had undergone a sex change operation up in San Francisco and paid for this operation with one of the kid's parents' uh, credit cards. Charges amounted to over $33,000. And that was only a portion of the cost. The rest was also reportedly charged to various credit cards. Then, according to police, Omar Arroyo and Delia Leon became lovers. The couple lived like royalty, running a luxurious home in LA's Woodland Hills. To give the impression they were a family, Arroyo brought his two daughters from a former marriage over from Puerto Rico. You haven't filled out an application. Okay. However, Fire life in Shangri-La soon hit a sour note when a new office assistant, reportedly besieged by complaints from angry parents, decided to go to the police. So where are you working? I'm working at Kids Music Kingdom, and that's in Mission Hills. It was a break detective Baio needed, but with only aliases to go on, he would need to conduct a stakeout to nail the alleged con artists. We conducted a surveillance in order to try to identify the, the true identity of our suspects. 
we were able to come up with their true names. Detective Baio then followed the suspects to their upscale neighborhood. A few days later, armed with a search warrant, police raided the home. NYPD police warrant! Let me see your hands up! Reportedly, Delia Leon attempted to escape through the backyard, but was quickly apprehended. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? She denied any involvement in the credit card scam. I was just a consultant. Watch your head, please, man. Police weren't so lucky with her alleged partner in crime. Omer Arroyo had left town just hours before the raid. I was surprised I'm not finding Omar. And I later learned that uh, he had left to Puerto Rico the night before. Omar was in the process of uh, doing promotions on his CD. Thanks to some parents who refused to be victims and skillful police work by Detective Baio, Delia Leon, a.k.a. Mario Yunus, was in custody and the music schools were closed down. Fortunately, Martha Gallardo was able to clear the excessive charges from her credit card. But many families paid a heavy price. In this broadcast, we presented the puzzling case of Sandra Oriana. She plummeted 10 stories to her death from this hotel balcony in Southern California. Investigators were uncertain if it was an accident, suicide, or murder. Sandra had come to California on a business trip with her boss, Robert Salazar. They checked into adjacent rooms on the eighth floor. The next morning, Sandra's body was found sprawled on the ground below. Police interviewed Robert Salazar. He said he had escorted Sandra to her room around midnight. He left her alive and well. But suspicions arose when detectives found articles of his clothing in her room. When questioned again, he offered a very different story. He said that he had, in fact, gone into the room with Sandra and that they had engaged in sex. And that at one point, they were on the balcony, Sandra had positioned herself on the railing of the balcony in such a way that she threw one of her legs over the top of the balcony and lost her balance and had fallen. Sandra's family was outraged by Salazar's allegations. They asserted she would never have consensual sex with him, that she was devoted to her fiance. Police used a dummy to test Salazar's account of what happened. We tried it several times, and we actually ended up trying to make it land where she landed. And we had to basically throw the dummy in that direction to make it land there. Despite the suspicions of the police, Robert Salazar was not charged with any crime until now. On March 2, 2001, nearly five years after Sandra's death, Robert Salazar was arrested for her murder. On May 30th, he appeared at a preliminary hearing in West Covina, California. Another large item. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that this be marked. Investigators said a reevaluation of evidence, as well as DNA tests, led to the district attorney finally charging Salazar. One Friday afternoon, Kim Swartz was preparing dinner when her seven-year-old daughter, Amber, asked permission to play in front of their Pinol, California home. Oh, but our friends are going to be here in five minutes. Please. Okay, Amber now. asked if Let's she could the uh, use the jump rope in the hall closet and jump rope outside. So I walked with her over to the closet and opened up the door, and she grabbed the jump rope. Thank you, Mommy. I and, love um, you. And on her way out the door, she just stopped and turned said, I love you, Mommy, and then out the door she went. 
Amber planned to jump rope until Kim's friend Debbie and her daughter Marisa came by. Hello, how Hi. are you two? Come in. They walk in the door and, you know, Marisa instantly asks where Amber was. And they said she was outside jumping rope. And so both of them at that point said, uh, we didn't see her out there. Um, so I said, well, maybe she was over in the vacant lot. I know she's out there. Go, go get her. Get so Marisa her. quickly ran right at back outside Absolutely. looking oh, for Amber. Oh, and glad it's Friday. Oh, me too. Yeah. She well, came running back inside yeah. saying she didn't see her. So at that point, I, I went outside. I started hollering Amber's name. Amber! Amber! And she wasn't there. So I called the only two people that I thought that Amber may have wandered off to, and I got answering machines. So obviously they weren't there. Amber! Amber! Amber, where are you? Amber! I couldn't find Amber. I was afraid. And I didn't want anything to be wrong. I wanted her to be home. Kim Swartz would never see her only daughter again. The disappearance of Amber was a second devastating tragedy Kim Swartz was forced to endure. Her husband, Bernie, a Pinole police officer, was killed in the line of duty when Kim was pregnant with Amber. This latest tragedy would transform the widowed mother of three into an activist. Following hours of searching, investigators concluded Amber Swartz had been abducted over here. The morning after she disappeared, a pair of pink socks was discovered in a park a short distance from Amber's home. When the park had been searched the previous night, the socks were not there. To come back the next morning and find these socks in a place that had already been searched um, certainly sent up a lot of red flags. They were just like the socks that Amber had on her feet, I could say that. That's because I had helped Amber put her new shoes on that we had just bought. We knew fairly quickly that this was going beyond our resources. And we reached out to the FBI and to the neighboring agencies and pulled in other resources so that we could conduct a, a proper investigation. Mrs. Swartz, I just have a few more questions that I'd like to ask you, okay? Okay. Okay. When FBI agents visited her home, Kim was struck by the unusual questions they asked. Have you been to Social Security in the last two or three days? No. Questions like, uh, had I or Amber received anything in the mail from someone that we didn't know? Had Amber come home with anything? She couldn't really explain who it came from to me. Had I received phone calls from anyone I didn't know? It just really bizarre questions, but the way they were being asked kind of led me to believe they were so specific that they had to be about somebody. In the days following Amber's disappearance, many strangers offered to help. But three days after her daughter vanished, Kim was visited by a man she will never forget. His name was Tim Hello, Bindmer. Tim. My name's Timothy. I'm with the search for Amber, for your dear Amber. He She's was, such a lovely girl. it looked like he'd been so up all night, basically was saying how he wanted to be the one to save her. He wanted to be the one to bring her home to me. I've been searching in a lot of places that and I think some of the authorities might not be searching for because I, I know kids. I, Bindner's I van kids. also caught Kim's kids. attention. It almost looked like a van that he painted himself. Um, he's got these plates that say, love you. Um, he's got uh, posters on the outside of the van. I want you to know, I want to be the one to find her. According to Kim, Bindner became extremely emotional as he talked of Amber. I want to be the one to save her and bring her back to you. Did you see Amber Swartz on June 3rd? No. Tim Bindler was questioned extensively by the FBI following Amber Swartz's abduction. According to authorities, the results of his polygraph were inconclusive. Did you speak to Amber Swartz on June 3rd? No. Tim Bindler is a, a very bright man. He's, he's a very intelligent man. He's a Berkeley grad. Uh, right up near the John Philpin is a trained forensic psychologist. He spent more than 1,000 hours interviewing Tim Bindler for his book, Stalemate. There are law enforcement agencies which consider him uh, a suspect. 
There's also the perception shared by a number of people uh, that, that uh, Tim um, has done absolutely nothing wrong and, and that he uh, is a misunderstood Good Samaritan. Tim Bindner's attorney, John Burroughs, maintains that Bindner's actions should not be viewed with suspicion. Point of fact is, he is trying to be helpful. He does that voluntarily. It is a sense that he has, that he has an obligation and a duty to go out and try to find uh, missing children. According to John Philpin, Tim Bindner seemed to have a particular interest in the grave of a girl named Angela Bouguet. Five-year-old Angela disappeared four and a half years before Amber and was later found sexually assaulted and strangled. The FBI placed Tim Bindner under surveillance. His alleged habit of visiting Angela Bouguet's gravesite up to 90 times a year had caught their attention. To have been to this little girl's grave, this little girl that he never knew, I just can't imagine anybody going to somebody's grave that many times in a, that period of time, unless there's something else going on in that person's mind. According to John Burris, the fact that Bindner visits grave sites should not cast suspicion on his client. For him, it has a special kind of uh, significance that is personal to him, uh, but certainly not an indication that uh, he's putting by in that graveyard. Good dog. Eleven days after Amber vanished, a bloodhound from the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Department tracked her scent to Angela's gravesite. Police say the dog also picked up Amber's scent in Bindner's van. However, California courts are often leery about the reliability of bloodhound evidence. Sadly, five months after Amber's disappearance, the East Bay area was shocked by the abduction of another young girl, nine-year-old Michaela Garrett, outside a Hayward market. As Michaela went to retrieve her scooter, a man forced her into his car. Michaela! By now, parents in the surrounding communities were living in fear. Then two months later, in nearby Dublin, 13-year-old Eileen Micheloff disappeared. Despite the fact that some suspicion had been directed at him, Tim Bindner helped search for Eileen. A few years later, a mother in the town of Fairfield informed the police that her daughter had begun receiving mail from a man they didn't know. One young girl was getting uh, letters from Tim. Oddly enough, these letters were written backwards and uh, it had to be held up to a mirror to read which I'm sure would set any parent on edge, you know, to have your kid all of a sudden get this really weird letter. I'm going to play with my friends down the street. Just a few blocks from where the letter was received, another young girl disappeared. Four-year-old Nikki Campbell was playing in her driveway. Nikki lived on Salisbury Drive in Fairfield, and she had been out playing uh, with her brother in the afternoon. Mom came home from work, asked, where's Nikki? While well, she's out playing, they couldn't find her. Four days after Nikki's disappearance, her scent, like Amber Swartz's before her, was allegedly tracked by bloodhounds to Angela Bouguet's grave, the grave that Tim Bindner reportedly visited so regularly. You put all of these coincidences together, you see them pile up, the dogs, the cemetery, uh, the, the various scents in the various places. And, and you really have to question, which is what I believe law enforcement was doing, and I think it's their role to do it. Uh, you, you really have to question, you know, is this a coincidence or is there something to it? If there was something more to it, uh, then you would think after all this time there had been some more evidence that was more definitive, and there hasn't been any. Following the Nikki Campbell disappearance, the Fairfield Police Department searched Tim Bindner's home and found nothing. Believing that his reputation had been unfairly tarnished by the Fairfield Police Department's handling of the Nikki Campbell investigation, Tim Bindner brought a defamation lawsuit against the city of Fairfield. The city settled out of court for $90,000. Citing the advice of his attorney, Tim Bindner turned down a request for an interview. 
Although he has been questioned by police, it's important to note that Binder has not been charged with any crime relating to the disappearances of these girls, and he has consistently claimed he is innocent. Kim Swartz refuses to give up. Even though Amber would today be in her 20s, Kim will not rest until she finds out what happened to her daughter. Within weeks of Amber's disappearance, Kim Swartz created the Amber Foundation for Missing Children. The foundation's goals continue to be educating parents on ways to prevent child abductions so that what happened to Kim Swartz may never happen to them. broadcast, we brought you the story of Gilbert Ortiz, who was looking for his young son, Jonathan. Authorities suspected that Gilbert's wife had taken Jonathan after she'd been accused of committing a heinous crime. After eight years, Gilbert and his son have finally been reunited. After serving in the military, Gilbert Ortiz moved with his wife and child to Redwood City, California. Though they were happy at first, Gilbert and Elizabeth fought frequently over money. When Gilbert received a promotion at work, he thought that his future suddenly seemed brighter. But within a week, Gilbert Ortiz was in a hospital suffering from cardiac arrest, kidney failure, and pneumonia, and fighting for his life. Doctors worked feverishly to determine what had caused him to become so violently ill. After lapsing in and out of consciousness for two weeks, Gilbert told police he thought he might have been poisoned. I lift weights and all, but I, I, I could never get big. And that's the kind of guy she likes. Gilbert said Elizabeth met him in the store parking lot to give him a special bodybuilding drink, which had already been mixed in a plastic sports bottle. It looked like a real shake. I mean, like a real chocolate shake. And then when I tried it, it sort of like burned my throat. And then my throat was really, really burning, you know, and I was all shaky. And then I feel like getting sick. Paramedics came and rushed Gilbert to the hospital. Elizabeth Ortiz met them in the emergency room. Doctors hoped that she could provide an explanation for Gilbert's sudden mystery illness. Have you ever seen that bottle? No, never. I've never seen this bottle. We needed to know where that sports bottle came from. If it was something that was purchased from a fast food store, um, and it was really a, a bad mixture that really made him sick, or whether it was a deliberate mix. This is Sequoia Hospital. I have a poisoning to report. I need to speak to an officer. After it had been determined that the shake had been tainted with a common insecticide, police obtained a search warrant to see if they could trace it or the plastic bottle to Elizabeth. But when they arrived at the Ortiz apartment, they discovered that Elizabeth Ortiz had vanished along with Jonathan. Then that's when it hit me. She did. When he told me, I said, where's the baby? She, he's gone. That's, that's the main part that really got me. With the evidence they gathered, police were able to make a case against Elizabeth Fuentes Ortiz, accusing her of attempted murder with special circumstances for torture. After following thousands of tips with possible sightings of Elizabeth Ortiz, Sergeant Catherine Anderson finally received a phone call from an FBI agent. Investigation unit, this is Sergeant Anderson. Basically, March 14th of 2000, I received a phone call from the FBI telling me that they had Elizabeth Ortiz in custody in Mexico. When Elizabeth was arrested in Mexico, she was by herself. The FBI gave me their word that they would continue to look for the little boy in Mexico in the area that they had arrested Elizabeth in. Elizabeth Ortiz was brought to Redwood City for trial. But where was Jonathan? Assuming that Elizabeth would want to see her son, Anderson had an age progress composite created and posted at the jail. Then Sergeant Anderson received the second phone call she had been hoping for. I received a phone call from a deputy telling me that they had a little boy at the jail and the little boy was a dead ringer for the composite picture that we had. 
Jonathan had been brought to the jail by a relative. According to the police, the boy had been living in Mexico during the time he was missing. The following day, Gilbert finally was able to see the son he had never stopped thinking about. I was two years old when he disappeared, and when I got him back, he was 10. I mean, yeah, as soon as I saw him, he, he just came and hugged me. <laughs> That's all it took. One big hug. I cannot explain what that felt like. It's just too much of an emotion, I guess. Gilbert and Jonathan have begun the long process of healing and getting to know one another as father and son. The hardest part of this experience was losing a little boy that I really loved. Not what she did, not what I went through, just losing him. Intriguing true tales on the next Unsolved Mysteries.